Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the number one resource for actors and talent seekers. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, and I'm here to guide you through every aspect of the entertainment industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. These intimate, inspirational conversations with today's most award-worthy film, television, and theater artists provide you, dear listener, advice on how to live the creative life, personal stories of success and failure alike, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. part of a bigger structure of things and to be able to shine within that parameter is like being a jazz musician with the metronome like <laughs> you know what I mean so that's careers are like that in many ways and so it's a and you your intention is proved out over time Welcome, listeners, to another episode of In the Envelope. I'm your host, Jack. I am so excited about today's episode featuring primetime Emmy nominee Giancarlo Esposito. Um, I should note, he and I had a conversation right off the top about the pronunciation of his name. Technically, we should all be saying Giancarlo Esposito. (laughs) It's my Italian best attempt at my proper Italian pronunciation, as Giancarlo is truly Italian. Most people kind of Americanize his last name and say Esposito. But um, technically, it is Giancarlo Esposito. And uh, for the purposes of the fact that he is American and we are American and he accepts Giancarlo Esposito, that is sort of how I'm saying it. Anyway, this interview is just amazing. I What an amazing actor. What an amazing interviewee. If you've seen any of his recent work in TV, Giancarlo is having a particularly great run on TV between all of his many, I would say, prestige TV dramas on many of which he plays, I would say, the kind of villainous, menacing role, which we got into. But more than anything, this interview, actors, is is really good to hear in terms of, it's been said on this podcast before, you know, there's so many different ways to talk about perseverance and how to endure in such a tricky and fickle and challenging industry. And I just really glommed on to this idea that Giancarlo spoke about of, your intention is proved out over time. I think this was the the best kind of iteration we've heard yet on the podcast of how to persevere in the industry, but also, you know, why? Why acting? Why art? Why are we as humans drawn towards creativity and towards audiences? It has to do with the ego. It has to do with the possibility of failure, embracing failure, um, and above all, passion. And that's sort of what this interview keeps coming back to. Anyway, it was such a joy to speak to somebody who is such a guru and he, who's been in the industry forever. He got his start way back in the day with being cast in a Spike Lee movie, much like recent guest Rosie Perez. But many people don't know Giancarlo started on Broadway and has multiple Broadway credits to his name and started on Broadway as a teenager. He was in something like four Broadway shows before he was even in college. He just has an amazing story and the work speaks for itself. So let's get to this interview. Remind your listeners, for the time being, we do not have a casting insider segment after the interview. But please head over to backstage.com slash casting to see the hundreds of I mean, thousands of available casting notices um, that's linked to in every episode. Do check out the episode description for more. And now, without further ado, let's take a quick break. Backstage's In the Envelope podcast sponsors include HBO Max presenting Hacks, nominated for 15 primetime Emmys, including Outstanding Comedy Series, and Outstanding Lead Actress in a Comedy Series for Gene Smart, Hacks is streaming now on HBO Max for your consideration. Giancarlo Esposito got his start as a child actor in musical theater, has worked in voiceover and radio, in countless films including Spike Lee's School Days, Do the Right Thing, and Malcolm X, and is now a five-time Emmy Award nominee, including for the role of Gus Fring on AMC's Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul from Vince Gilligan. 
This year, he's nominated for his work on Disney Plus's The Mandalorian and appears on Godfather of Harlem, Dear White People, Jet, and The Boys. Here is the astonishing Giancarlo Esposito. Whereabouts are you? Currently, I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Okay. As I'm uh, in the uh, sixth and final season of, of Better Call Saul. So exciting. It really is. It's been a bang up season. We've been stepping around and adhering to all the nuance of the COVID protocol, yeah. but doing it well as a family. We're well into 608. And so I know they want to do 13 and we'll see. We'll see how the timing works with all that's going on in the world and the health of right. our cast member and all that. Interesting. Yeah. And, and it's, I mean, this is like an, no pressure, but isn't the last season of uh, Better Call Saul the most important one? <laughs> well, in a way, I, I think it is. It, it, I w- always said that, you know, if there were a bookend to mm-hmm. um, Breaking Bad, it would be Saul. And then if we were able to look at them backwards and forwards in the different orders, most of us are coming to Saul after having seen all Breaking Bad. But what if you were able to watch what, oh, what okay. is the prequel first and, and it fit seamlessly into Breaking Bad, Saul first, mm-hmm. then Breaking Bad, th- that would be monumental. And I have a feeling we're moving in that direction. That's so cool. Yeah. Um, it's a prequel series is always, that's just so fascinating. Um, and I definitely want to get into it. Thank you so much for taking the time. I'm so, it seems like a very exciting uh, time to talk to you. Congratulations on your Emmy nomination, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, I, I was blindsided by it. And I think that's the best way to be. Didn't sure. expect it, didn't know it was being announced, um, had in a way lost track, knew that we were hoping and or that my people were hoping, but was really, you know, very um, surprised. So in that surprise came a wonderful gratitude and honoring for the Academy and also for fans who just mm. watch my work and, and believe in me. Um, not that I didn't think I could, but uh, it's it's been nice to have been nominated um you know, for the last couple of years, uh, uh, continuously. And mm-hmm. that honor of just getting that phone call, I was like, oh, I already won. That was it. I mean, you can't <laughs> top great. that feeling. So I'm in totally. gratitude. And the fact that it's happening, I mean, you're currently playing Gus Fring for, I guess we could say the last time, nothing certain in the, in the age of TV, but how exciting. It, it is. You know, I love being a part of the, Breaking Bad family, and I, I love as much being a part of the Better Call Saul family. Um, you know, some of course some of the same creators, uh, a few of possibly the same writers uh, as well, mm-hmm. uh, and a plethora of directors who, in the sixth season, have been sort of handpicked by Vince um, in a beautiful way, uh, as to not only throw us back to the original series and mm-hmm. some of our directors we had then, uh, but also to our newer directors in our writer producers and that's always a great thing when tom schnauz or someone else directs Mm -hmm. because they know the world this world and they know in very clear or when vince directs how he wants to see it so but this last season you know is is probably you said you referred to the possibility of it being the most important season (laughs) i would tend to agree because um uh, the show has has been a great blend of some really great comedy moments, but all in all, the edge and the seriousness of the show have played in greatly to the morality of what the writers are trying to express. And that is um, a great example of a television show. Yeah. But uh, also the dramatic nature of the show is serious. And as you know, to be closer to, to Breaking Bad, um, the circumstance gets more serious. Yes. So, yeah, so uh, <laughs> uh, look for a wild ride in in in, uh, in this last and final season. I I I've been honored to play this character for so very long, and think I have found some nuance in playing him in this newest incarnation. But uh, as you said, you never know in television. But uh, <laughs> it, it's sad to say goodbye to someone that you've cultivated and nurtured. But it's also when it's time, it's time. Oh, absolutely, and it's so cool to hear like. Um, Of course, I'm going to grill you about process and about your approach and craft, 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 craft. Um, You've spoken to Backstage many times before. Can I first ask you, what is your relationship with Backstage? 
did you use us back in the day? Absolutely. You know, I have a very, uh, very, <laughs> a very, very fond memories of backstage because that's how I was given the ability to know what open calls were and how I could go have my face be seen, even if I wasn't on the A-list of actors that they see through a casting director. So it allowed me to know information mm -hmm. from my career that was valuable that led to me getting numerous gigs uh, and put me on the map of casting directors. So I've always loved the informative nature of backstage because when people ask me, to be honest with you, young actors, I know um, it's a, a much more of an online presence. Mm -hmm. uh, I tell them, get backstage. They say, mm -hmm. what's that? I said, it's going to tell you so much information and put you on a, a course where you're going to want to know more because there is a protocol in this thing we call show business. So I'm, I'm grateful to everyone at backstage for the ability to, to have kept going through these tough times. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. So take us back to the very beginning. I mean, it was in that era of, of, of combing through backstage. You made a, your Broadway debut at age eight. What was the earliest, like, inspirations were you bit by an acting bug you know um I, I grew up in a very creative family of an italian father who was from naples and a black mother from alabama mm -hmm. who went to europe after winning the marion anderson scholarship for a voice going to international house in new york and then then transferring to to europe uh basically to italy to to do an internship and be paid to start singing uh, mm -hmm. She came out of Caramu House. So she met my dad at, at San Carlo Opera um, in Milan, where he um, and then followed him as well to Rome, where he worked as a stage technician with his father. Mm -hmm. So um, so that's that's sort of my lineage and, and where I come from in regard to the creative nature of the household. Then cut forward 10 years, um, almost 10 years, maybe I was about eight years old. Um, moved to New York. Um, mother uh, had uh, been out of opera for a little while. And I decided I wanted to try to help out by going to an audition for a Broadway musical mm -hmm. and uh, did that. And that was my beginnings. Uh, it was really as a singer, dancer, hoofer. And I learned that as I went um, mm -hmm. from the time of eight till the time I was 17 on Broadway doing different musicals. So I grew up at a time of Michael Bennett and Grover Dale, Anita Morris, um, Pearly Victorious was on Broadway, Pippin, you know, uh, 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 yeah, all, all of those great shows continue, continuing my relationship with the stage and the theater for many years. And so, but it was, you know, it was during a time period where I was starting to wanting to be on my own mm -hmm. and knew that, um, that I, I was always the one who hustled harder than any agent. So after my first agent, Ernestine McClendon, I started to want to branch out from just Broadway to television. I had worked for RKO, Ray Fowler okay. doing, doing radio work because I knew at that time, blacks weren't able to get as many opportunities. So I used my voice. Mm -hmm. So I would, you know, so I, I, that training has led me to be on the mic quite a bit. I'm, I've got a couple of projects coming out where, you know, I'm the voice of the product mm. uh, or some system. Um, and so, you know, that that has really guided me in terms of being intimate with the mic and having that Broadway musical stage presence sort of come out in in, in because you we, we do that. We do things in a, in a, in a celebratory, uh, songful way. Uh. Um, so basically, I I feel like my early career trained me for the discipline of film mm -hmm. and television. Um, but I feel like th those were the times where I needed to, because I worked harder than an agent worked for me, I needed tools. And so, you know, there was um, backstage, of course, which was always the stanchion, but there was also show business magazine back then. And, uh, and I remember buying this with my mother um, and just reading it and combing it to find opportunities that uh, I could use to display my talent. But it wasn't without that, that guide. There were a few other you know, um, books that you could get that told you who everybody was and what, uh, what uh, office the casting person may have been on Park Avenue or, or Sixth sure, Avenue sure. or, you know, that's before all, of, all they all moved downtown, like A.B. Kaufman and all these great 
casting directors at the time. So it was the backstage that taught me. And part of the discipline that came out of not only getting information was applying it. So it was a part of a discipline. It allowed me to know. And, and newspapers for me were great because I'm tactile. I'm an artist. I like to work with my hands. I feel like physically as an actor, I work with my body, but my brain and mind and spirit. And, and a part of me that gets lucky is when I match up what I know should be with the characterization. Like with Gus, I just stilled my body. I'm really Italian, like to just gesticulate, <laughs> like to express myself in many different ways. But I took yes. all that away with a certain character to create a discipline. Well, with that, with my earlier career was the same thing. You know, if you really wanted to make it, no one was going to make it for you. Mm. The boys who came from California had more pretty faces and they had more of a chance and then could make the head staying power long enough to get to get chops. Then mm. they'd work like all the cats from like taps and yeah. that I worked with and all the actors who I knew then and still know now who have somewhat of a career because they work either across the board in theater and film and television. They were able to, to become better, faster if they had a desire for the depth. So part of the discipline of looking for work, I was trained, man. I was trained on Broadway in the streets of New York. But part of that was I always had uh, a paper underneath my arm, whether it be um, the Daily News, the backstage, or the show business you bought every week. I think, I remember, I think it, it was published on a Tuesday or Wednesday and you'd grab it. You know, on a Wednesday would be the perfect time because you're in between shows, you do a matinee show, you run and get the backstage. Oh, cool. Keep yourself abreast of what's happening so you can get a job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is so cool, this idea that the craft and the career are so intertwined, like the way you talk about the discipline. It's because of the work ethic you learned in the craft that you then apply that to like different areas of the biz. You probably could have just continued on the theater track, right? And instead you were like looking at TV and film and you were looking at radio. There were reasons that connected me. Radio has always been a first love because in a way, although you think you, you might think you can hide, um, folks who are listening are astute listeners. So they get a sense of who you are as a human being. And if you're honest with the mic, honest with yourself, mm. the fear goes away and you're able to communicate some things that are real, yeah. truthful and honest. Mm. If you're hiding and actors do hide, we all, some of us get lost in roles and can't get back and think different things about ourselves. Um, but ultimately we're channels for information and heartfelt felt spirituality, spirituality and some kind of visionary accomplishment. Right. That's all the things that encompass film and all the, all the things that ac accomplish a visual movement, which is an artistic musicality, um, which is great, you know, uh, but to be able to be a part of that, you're part of a bigger structure of things. And to be able to shine within that parameter is like being a jazz musician with the metronome. Like, uh -huh. well, you know what I mean? So that's careers are like that in many ways. And so it's a, and you, your intention is proved out over time. If you really love telling stories and being a storyteller um, and don't get wrapped up in the ego for me as an actor, it's been a, it's been a journey to slay the ego to yeah. be able to get to the better work. Right. You know, because I'm not acting anymore. I'm not trying to act. I'm trying to channel. Sure. That's a deeper thing. So my work on Godfather of Harlem has been rewarding. I don't know if I've mm. gotten it right, but I play Adam Clayton Powell Jr. And I've adopted mm. his voice and movements and, and try to give a hint of who he was as a human being physically and intellectually. Um, and also, um, also with having some fun and taking a little dramatic license when necessary, but playing a colorful, really powerful human being that a lot of people don't know about. Well, that's, that's to me is the example that I can jump off from not to say that me creating Gus wasn't any different, you know, in its expression, it was finding it anew, creating it, drawing on the history of all that's me and I, all that I've absorbed to have that happen and making the right choices and decisions mm -hmm. to not be an Italian Giancarlo Esposito, the loud, very demonstrative dude, but to be a very subdued Gustavo Fring who studied uh, uh, intimate details of a human being um, through sizing them up mm -hmm. and a very quiet, different acting style. So that's a gift to do that. And I don't claim that gift is mine. I claim it as a channeling effort via information that I've adopted and, and the choices and chances I've taken in creating characters. So I feel so blessed to have, to be in the position and place I'm in because I, I don't, 
if I don't feel it, I ain't doing it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's a great place to be, you know? Yeah, I love that. And I, lo- I love this idea of, um, what did you say? The intention will play out. Like, if you love it enough, that's what's going to get you through. And that is the through line, is the passion for what you do. You know, I, I, I couldn't have said it better. You're so astute in, in, in hearing that and recognizing that as a gem. Um, the intention plays out in your life and, and we find, you find out for yourself, not to get to prove to anyone or be judged by anyone, but that you find out, you know, what your heart really wants and really means. And, and you might think it's one thing. And mm-hmm. if you're not willing to stay with it, um, now I'm saying that now being on the privileged size of the, of the fence. So I, I can understand that people go, ah, easy for you to say, but I, I know from my past sure. experience, it's, of struggle within the business and even economically that, that that didn't affect my goal of, of creation. I just had to create in a different way, understanding of how to, you know, uh, allow myself uh, a space to, to be courageous mm. and ride it out. Yeah. But for me, and I can tell you my, how I, what I, I can look back what my strategy has been. It's just been do everything that means something to you. And I, my career was mm. saved five different times to Sundays. I'm a film actor, stage actor first, mm-hmm. then a film actor, which I is my one now one of my preferred. I'm a director. I've directed two films and and I have some surprises coming this year and TV shows that I've directed. But um that that that's encompassing of the whole vision and you have to have a bigger and different way of looking at it to do that successfully and get and have fun and learn and get some juice out of it. Mm-hmm. Um that's a whole that's a bigger pie than what I do as an actor. But um, what I do as an actor is just much more intimate and personal and, and you know, is a self-expression that if you're an actor first, then it's really a personality issue. You're trying to figure out your own personality. Yeah. But I'm bl- blessed that, you know, through what I do, I've been able to have a leg up on that, you know, in, in a way. But now I feel, so the strategy has been, do it means something, and then don't be exclusive. Um, oh, okay, yeah. So that allowed me in, in the last five years, I mean, three years ago, I was doing four TV shows at one time. And mm-hmm. this year I'm on The Boys. I'm on Mandalorian, Star Wars, uh, Better Call Saul, which has been a year pulled back. You'll see it next year. But The Boys, I've finished third season. Mandalorian, we're going to start mm-hmm. the third season. So it's been, I've hit a lot of different demographics mm-hmm. and, and they've all been hits. <laughs> so yes. and, and they're all going at one time. So when you did refer to, um, yeah, intention. My intention is to tell great stories and be a part of that, learn to direct, learn how to tell them in a beautiful way and to try to also pay attention to what needs to be told um, in this redevelopment time of, of all of our media and, and continue to do theater and have intention of uplifting people. But the other, you know, the other part of it is where does this new world leave us and how do we continue to, to express wonderful stories? It's books, I think. Um, it's it's film, it's television, but they it, everything is changing so very quickly in, in the standard form of how we view it. But I've been ab- able to be a part of at least four shows this season um, that are they're they're doing not not half bad. <laughs> you know? Absolutely, you know I, I think it's what is it for Godfather Han, Better Call Saul, mm-hmm. Mandalorian, and The Boys. Four solid shows, you know, in different Absolutely. demographics, and that's been what's held me together. Yeah. It seems like you knew from the very beginning that dry spells and rejections and I don't know if I want to use the word failure. I'd love to ask you about your relationship with failure, but you knew from the beginning that that was going to be inevitable and talk to me about how everything you just described like has to do with the ego. I feel like actors have a complicated relationship with their ego because it is, is inherently part of the job, right? To grapple with the ego. I, don't, I, I think it's where you are in your, your journey spiritually, which has everything but nothing to do with acting. Mm. I mean, you know, look, if I realize I'm just a drama queen at times and the more mature I get, the less drama queen I am, then I can get myself in a quick one-liner and go, Jesus, there I go again. Go, you know what I mean? I need love and attention, really. I'm such a complainer and a bitch monger right now. You know, so um, I remember, but your, your, your comments um, have me thinking about you know, how important what I do is to me. And so if I think about a failure 
You know, uh, I can think about an experience of being let go from a play and that that just sunk me. Um, yeah. it, it sunk me. It was it was way, way off off Broadway. And um, I, I held my work in such high regard and I was depressed and all this stuff was going on. The, the lead of the play wasn't the easiest guy. And, you know, instead of just bowing out, I tried to show up <laughs> you know? oh. and I, 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 I hate myself for it. This is like 20, <laughs> over 25 years ago. And they were, you know, in the hindsight, you know, it stung me for years, but it had me really have to take a look at my integrity mm. and how a people pleaser person I was by not being able to say, you know, I think I'm not up for this. I'm not right. well, it's not a good time for me, you know, um, all those things. And, and I should have done that before, you know, they let me go. Um, but I'm glad because I never go out the door half asked. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I just can't do it. I have to have thought about things thoroughly and uh, to allow myself to be free within the margin of that metronome. The metronome. That is such a great metaphor. It's like idea of musicality. It really seems like music is in your bones. It is, you know, I, I, I catch myself trying to, you know, in the show I'm doing right now and, you know, it's in the forefront of my brain. I, I you know, I speak Spanish and I'm a Latin um, person. Mm -hmm. So that's a different rhythm, a different music. And because I have to speak the language, um, I rehearse it a lot. Mm -hmm. And where I would normally pause as I am in this conversation right now, the Spanish would not pause. They keep talking like this all the time. Mm -hmm. And then they stop because that's the way it goes when you're speaking a language like that. You are, you know what I mean? So that's a whole <laughs> different way of speaking. And it's just against the way I break up a sentence. You know? yeah. <laughs> yes. You know, but their sentences are said differently. So that's the, only, the best example I can give. The more I do it, the more I realize not to forget about the musicality of it. But yeah. then when, you're, when I'm shooting it, remind myself to forget it then. Because then it doesn't matter, you know, because after that, it's in you and you say mas the same way, <laughs> you know, you, 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 you know, you, you say nada the same way. It has that same guttural sound that, you know, and you don't have mm. to think about it anymore, but you have to get to that point. So, yeah. you know, Which so I, 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 I refer to it as music. This episode of Backstages in the Envelope is brought to you today by HBO presenting I May Destroy You, nominated for nine Emmy Awards, including Outstanding Limited or Anthology Series and Outstanding Lead Actress in a Limited or Anthology Series or Movie for Michaela Cole, consider the critically acclaimed I May Destroy You, available to stream now on HBO Max. It sounds like you have to sink into the character and after a certain point you do know this person. First of all, do you speak about your characters in the third person? Are they you on set? Like how in character are you? Uh, you know, I, I always like to be called by my, my name on set if I'm referred to. Now, because I'm in this season a little more intimate with cast members, um, particularly with, with directors and ADs who are very respectful and because people know me not only as Gus, but as other characters, Mm -hmm. um, they'll sometimes refer to me as Giancarlo, but mm -hmm. I prefer to be called by my character name on set Cool. and to think like that. I, I'm not a big chit chatter. Um, and I, I hate to sound and feel like a killjoy, <laughs> but, um, television is so fast, man. Yeah. We, we learn our lines. Sometimes we purposely learn them halfway because we want to leave room to be able to be spontaneous and have mm -hmm. some nerves about it. But with this show, what they write is, is, is b better than what you could ever think of. So, you know, I want to honor all that, but when I want to get there, my character's in its very specific head, uh, you know, and, and so I, I always want to be focused and yeah. uh, in, in terms of regard to sound and distraction. Um, I, I, I insist on that, that kind of mm -hmm. focus. So I'll remove myself and go in a corner if I have to, to avoid cell phone conversations, actor conversations, talking about, gotcha. you know, 1920 when backstage with first came out and their grandfather, who, <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not there. <laughs> that totally makes sense. Totally. I mean, it's fascinating to me and I want to be there, but see, that is human nature. That's like our phone. Right. It's yeah, 
I know something about that. I want, I could lend to that conversation. I appreciate that conversation. I love that conversation. Then you're tempted to jump into it when I really want to be right here with you yeah. right now. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Well, that's actually kind of good to hear. Like in a way it's a relief to hear that because I was going to ask you about, I mean, the concept of a villain, but also just in general, like if you were somehow switching between Moff Gideon and, and Stan Edgar on the boys. And of course, Gus Fring and just like turning that on and off there would be, that sounds a little sociopathic. Like (laughs) it makes sense that you would need to be in the mindset of somebody is still as Gus Fring and as, I mean, can I say menacing? You do menace better than anyone on TV. Well, thank you. I try to find the <laughs> fresh and new idea and feeling of what that means. So um, because um, these characters came to me in the last few years, of course, Gustavo Fring was cemented in me, although I had to recreate him and celebrate his um, energetic posture and nature and Saul years later. Yeah. Um, I found like, I feel like I found nuance for that. That was my first challenge. How will I do that? Um, what kind, what will I be down to a point where I was uh, looping in, in, in episode, Oh, we're into six, the fourth season. Then I went to the ADR to, room to ADR align. And mm-hmm. I thought my performance is really off. And I asked the ADR specialist and she said, Oh, you just got to remember that you're it's six years before breaking bad. You know, Gus was a very, in a very different place because I just thought my, maybe I was a little over modulated in this scene. Hmm. Um, it didn't match my idea of what Gus was in breaking bad. Well, guess what? We're not in breaking bad. Yeah. So I, it was the right feeling. I had revisited it months later and thought, Oh, did I do the right, make the right decision on the day? That's how actors think. Yeah. yeah. Are we in a way, you know, have this ego thing, and that we that's at play of course we do again i can't remember that you know that play and and what happened that's a failure but it's also if you turn that into a learning experience about yourself then it changes who you are and if you have an ego that's like how do i want to say it the word that comes to my brain is hospitality that's your you're being hospitable to your your essence that that is oh. just um somehow uh attacked to praised, you know, Touched I mean, praise. yeah. yeah, to, to be praised and be treated a certain way. Yeah. We all want to be treated lovingly, but we want to be treated. I want to be truthful, tr- be treated truthfully as well. So that image is almost idolatry, which has to make you think about who you really are and what you really need. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, in a way. And there are human beings who aren't actors who have all those traits. So, <laughs> For me, I, I think I'm blessed and have, you know, all that comes into play. Why do you do anything in front of an audience? <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know wow. what I mean? There's a trade-off. It's for the audience, but it's also for you. And if you feel like you're connected to that gift, then pursue that, whatever that is. And that's sure. what I've been doing. It's the channeling again. Like, d- like can, it, can we use the image of a vessel? People on this podcast have described themselves as vessels. I would tend to absolutely agree, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and because we're all, and if I think about vessels, it has me think about balloons, that round circular floating balloon, the skin of the light, transparent skin Mm -hmm. of dreams and expectations and wonder and moral fiber and character and story and, and connection uh, to ancestry all Mm -hmm. lives in that bubble. But you, we also see the face of that bubble, which is you. And Mm -hmm. that face, we know when we see it, if it's true or if it's somehow off kilter or out of step or desirous or gluttonous or, you know what I mean? We, if you really look, you can see all those things. Not that you need to judge them, but you know, I hopefully people peer into my bubble and see that I I meant some good and love Mm -hmm. this storytelling thing. And there's some truth to my life, but, um, people question that and don't know it because their lives aren't over. Well, what's going to happen at the very end when you take your last breath, is it going to be, Oh, there was truth to your life. <laughs> you know, some voice and matter from God. I don't know about that. I think the truth to your life is enjoying that truth now. Yes. So I'm loving, you know, to play all these characters. Do I feel psychotic? Luckily I had a pretty good schedule. I had to jump. I think if I remember correctly between the between a, a breaking bad no between mandalorian and the boys so i was nervous because in mando i had a mustache 
playing Moff Gideon, <laughs> they need reshoots. I went in there and shot like four episodes, bam, 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 bam. But then it, it real time lapsed and I had to go to Toronto. And I was like, oh, my mustache, can't get it back. Blah, 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 blah. You know, where those mustaches from, from, uh, from Godfather of Harlem that first season. Oh, I had all those mustaches made in Toronto. So that, that's what my mind is on. So yeah. finally, I, w- I go to Toronto to do the boys. I leave the mustache. And I'm like, no, Stan Edgar don't have a mustache. Okay. Like, it's not, I don't know. He just <laughs> doesn't. He ain't that Billy D kind of swab at, you know, saber wheel and dude. <laughs> so I said, Stan Edgar's a company man, clean shape. You know, I had to make all these decisions. So I, I think I went between those. Uh, and then I had a little time before that year coming back to Saul because there was this whole idea that I wanted a different hairstyle for Saul than I had in Breaking Bad. And it was mm-hmm. pre Mando, so it worked out well, but I would never use that haircut <laughs> Stan Edgar. So that if you want to really want to know what actors think about that <laughs> kind of stuff, I think about because I'm so meticulous, like yes. where are the glasses I used, where is this, where is that? And then after all that, it's like, can I do it again? Who yes. is Stan Edgar again? I got to go back to my notes. Like who, yes. what this guy, how does he speak? Do I need to go back and look at it? Do I need to just look at Anthony? Because I love working with Anthony. You know, I, do, I, I, what, how do I put Billy Butcher in his place? In, in a Stan Edgar way, not a Gustavo Fring way. Mm-hmm. So Stan is, you know, he has some of the same qualities, but very different reactions, very fluid, very in the moment. Not that he's gregarious at all, but someone yeah. who can re- put you in your place. He's flat company dude. He's going to win because he can out talk you, out think you, out swab you out refer you, <laughs> you, know, you know, and yes. then make you feel small, but still human. So you want to kill him, but you can't because he's kind of too smart for you to kill. You know, it's all right. You know, you know what I mean? So the, all those things are, are what I think about. And I think, yes, um, I find a way to exist within the bubble of that circle that draws on all of my ancestry in different phases, parts, years, and incarnations to yes. inform some qualities that my characters play. Yes. Okay. That balloon metaphor is so, it's so spot on. That's so, I love a good um, poetic metaphor to describe that process. I always, often try to be rational about how I describe what I do to people, but I, I, I think I've just gotten beyond that point. <laughs> you know, I, I st- I'm starting to have to dig deeper in developing characters from, um, I'm developing a historical character and um, developing a, uh, a character beside that that's that's not historical but i'm realizing to imbibe them which is my desire is to play that every man like and folks love me mm. as as playing the 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 uh antagonist the villain mm. but um uh, i did make a film called gospel Hill years ago which i directed where i played um in a way in every man yeah um but a little bit nefarious but in every man and i also <laughs> directed my second film um this is your death uh, opposite Josh Jamel, I was really playing an every man. So I'm still in the investigation of the every man. Like, what does that mean? Not, not the yeah. heroic figure, the heroic bad guy, the badass of all time. I played him, playing him now again, you know, the business badass. But what about the every man? Mm. So for me, that's interesting. It's been my next investigation in maybe one mm. or two different incarnations because I feel like that's where we are in our world. Yeah, You know, it's like, it, it the stuff's gotten deep it's gotten serious yeah and so i feel like as i said earlier you may have caught it i'm sure you did you're very astute <laughs> i feel like i'm on the other i'm on the privileged end now right yeah. because people call me for work and i'm creating my own work and networks are looking at me and i go in as a producer director and pitch stuff and they're listening and they're leaning forward and i'm just telling the story and trying to figure out what that is because i'm yeah. working with some of the best and sometimes I win, sometimes I lose, but I, I have that desire to know the whole piece and the whole picture. So that passion's there. Mm-hmm. And so I feel like if I can live my, my life in that passionate phase, I'll always be happy. I'll always be creating and the universe is not going to let me down. Do you know what I mean? I'm out of the fear. Maybe that's really the crossover is the passage out of fear to understand, oh, I have a voice and I should, mm-hmm. uh, I, I, I am investigating just what that voice says mm. because sometimes we get into a place where you want to tell people what you know they want to hear because you can sell your project project absolutely yes and, and i realize i'm a good salesman i can sell stuff but you know I, I i can't sell stuff i'm not really um passionate about yeah that's why it so, always comes back to the following your gut but about what really really speaks to you and do that yeah exactly 
at any level that's ex- of success. Yeah, that's that that's exciting to me. Yeah. Um, so I'm I you know I'm I I'm really I'm interested in you know how that plays out in my other life. Yeah. And yes, I refer to Giancarlo Esposito that I as that Giancarlo. So it's helped me to separate my ego mm. and self from that just that name. Yeah. And my experience is encapsulated with some fans and some people reflect that. So I can also put that in that same place and be understanding, compassionate, giving, mm. loving, but understanding why I've been brought to their attention. Some of them come to me and they express a deeper connection. You know, mm. with your role in this reminded me of my father or my mother, or you healed me from, I binged this whole show and I had an epiphany or what, you know, whatever sure. that is. That's wonderful to me. But I also understand that they don't really know me. And so my opportunity to talk to you today and, and to get cleaner about who I am in regard to my craft and my mm. life, I don't think there's much of a separation. And if you think about it, most lives probably don't. There's mm. a reason we go through what we go through and we do what we do and have chosen the, the path we have. That sounds a little privileged, but it's not. In a way, it's, it's, it's a way of, for me to empower myself or continue to empower myself to create opportunities that make me happy. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, and, and, and follow my interests um, that also make me uh, quizzical and wondering and, you know, inquisitive. Mm-hmm. Um, those are the, the aspects of life, I think, that, that sometimes we miss enjoying when we get wrapped up. And there's a lot of, you know, a time in our world now is to, to stump for, you know, dealing with our environmental issues, our political issues, and yeah. we'll always be dealing with those. And understanding, you know, this, all of the things that could be coming at us from our neglect and trying to prepare for those. One of them being, you know, whatever's made or created or leaked or whatever, it's affecting a large number of people. And we got to get that under control. Yeah. Yeah, it's all it's so funny, because I, re- I really was going to ask about work life balance and, you know, what non acting things feed into acting, but it sounds like it's just all, it is all interconnected. And it's part of this mission of, of being honest, you're in the pursuit of honesty, it sounds like. Yeah, I, I, I would like to be around that. Uh, I guess I'm still, you know, in, in a way, I'm still enjoying the experience. Yeah, which yeah, which is which is always the key. Thank you so much. You're 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 giving such a beautiful window into your process and into your mentality. And I feel like I feel like we should do this interview once a year to just check in and see how that journey is changing because it sounds like this is all you know directly relevant to to this moment here in the middle of 2021. Like here in the middle of all of your all of your many projects. Well, you know, it's it's a pleasure to talk because part of me. Um, still even on the zoom get subconscious in front of the camera until I'm putting on my costume in certain ways and you know doing a a, a split screen or um, switching the screen to gallery view is still a piece of me in a corner and so I look for opportunities during interviews to try to share who I really am and and part of this is and not that I wouldn't be any difference if I didn't have the screen but knowing that it wasn't going to be used as a way to get intimate Mm-hmm. But sometimes voice to voice is even better uh, yeah. because you get a chance to really experience someone's spirit. And that's important to me, at least uh, in the things that I hold valuable in this life. Mm-hmm. That's really true. It's, it's absolutely, it ties back to what you were saying about um, real voice artistry. I mean, voice acting. Um, your narration is my favorite part of Dear White People. <laughs> that, that voice that then, of course, you became a flesh and blood character that was such a fun twist. <laughs> yeah, I really very much like that show and yeah. a very fun twist, but it, it, it gave me a chance to be creative in a different way. And then mm-hmm. um, they were very, very pleased that I, I was agreeable and amenable to be on camera, which is always fun. <laughs> uh, we, I'm glad you saw that. It's, it's been really great talking to you. So uh, great talking to you. So, and so I'll great. take you up on it. We can do this once a year. And that'll work. <laughs> And like, I really hope that uh, the pandemic will be such that we can do this in person at some point. That would be, that would be delicious. <laughs> yes. Um, can I ask you before you go, uh, we, uh, we have to ask about auditions, of course. And as you were saying, this is a, this is a point in your career where, I mean, thank you so much for speaking frankly about this period of maybe privilege in your career, but um, how often are you auditioning? When was the last time you audit, you know, what is your, your approach? What is your philosophy around auditions? Look, I, I used to have 
a, a very visceral aud- uh, audition feeling. You always have those nerves and all that, but mm-hmm. I allowed myself to know that I, I would have to prove it and why not have a go at it? You know, <laughs> that's how I think about it. Mm-hmm. And then I, I started to be auditioning for things which I knew maybe should have been offers, but I was struggling with my ego. So okay. I had to go through that stage when certain directors are calling to see if I'm available for a meeting. And I like that the best because you can show who you really are. Mm. And so I have particular stories about some of those meeting um, uh, West Ball from Maze Runner and uh, knowing that there was another actor up for it, knowing who that actor was. Uh, mm. But he wants to meet with you and you have to fly yourself to California to do that. Calling my daughter to say this Maze Runner series by James, you know, I've read them all, Papa, you got to do that movie. Yeah. Right. Or whatever that was. And so I, I flew out and and Wes and I hit it off. And of course, I got the offer for that movie, but it wasn't like I had to read for it. And so then after something like that, being asked to read for something mm-hmm. um, is an interesting process. So you have to go, hmm, OK, well, why am I reading if it's not audition? Well, it's kind of off the cuff and connected with you and the director. Blah, 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 blah. And you decide if you want to do it. I have since after struggling with the ego because it plays into all of that, made a decision that auditioning was an opportunity to create that day. So when I changed the wording in my brain and spirit, it was an opportunity for me to do my craft, to practice. I'm preparing for the audition for two days, have the sides, going to memorize it. And then I've got to visualize how I'm going to walk in and do it all and put them in the space that the scene is placed in, whatever Mm -hmm. that takes. And so it became something else other than, the the approval of someone else or the other eye watching me i'll go do this i'll prepare this i'll walk in in costume and just do it and walk out (laughs) i can be anonymous in a way i don't even have to say my name they know who i am right so it gave me a chance to do my theater and so now so uh, if, if i and i would still audition for anything normally it's a meeting with a director and sometimes it's a reading behind that i would do that it gives me an opportunity to work today Mm. And that's what I do. Like, why would I ever deny myself that opportunity? Oh, because I want them just to offer it to me. My ego's in the way, or I might not get it. Fear. Oh, shoot. Am I just afraid? Totally. You know, why don't you just want to go do your thing? This is how you see it. If they don't like it, they're going to give you the gig. Screw it. At least you did what you do. Yes. <laughs> It comes back to that intention. If the, the intention plays out, it has to always come back to the passion for what you do. That's right. And you can take responsibility or not. I, I know yes. when I've had an audition, it's a little bit off. I know when I've walked in like for Money Monster to meet Jody Foster and there were four guys out there that I knew three of them were Italian. One was Puerto Rican, you know, and all these different types. I knew when I walked in the door and started talking to her, um, I knew that I was getting that gig. I yeah. had nothing yeah. about anybody who's out there. They could have picked a whole different type, but I knew that she was interested in me yeah. and and I, I was being asked to read way beyond the beyond. And I knew as soon as I read, she was not going to let me leave the room. And that's what happened. <laughs> cool. But that's the way I saw it. Do you know what I mean? I created that. And literally, you know, she finally just looked at me. I looked at her. I said, look, you know, and there's other people in the room. There's people <laughs> waiting. It's E.B. Kaufman's I was really small. And I'm like, you know, I should go. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, you know what? You should go. <laughs> And I said, I'll see you soon. And she said, sure thing. Bye. And that was, and that was it. Wow. I didn't get around to see how the other guys did. I walked out of there knowing they're going to call me in a fucking What hour. a dream. <laughs> yes. But I, but that, but I've had the opposite experience where I've yes. gone in and I haven't been so prepared or haven't been so confident. And I did really well. And I walk out and I go, oh, damn, I'm not going to get it. Those blah, 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 blah. Early actors say that. But if you're a seasoned actor, you say, what did I not do? Oh, right. I didn't do this, this, and this. I didn't take mm-hmm. it seriously. You know, I didn't. I, if you feel like you came out, you didn't do your best, then you don't deserve the gig. Yeah. You got to go in and get this stuff. And yeah. for me, every day I go on set, it's the same thing. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't look to judge myself anymore, but I know if I haven't hit the mark. And I know the mark for me is way beyond whatever, whatever their expectation of me is. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what, because whatever director you are, I don't care who you are, if you haven't been an actor and don't understand that, whatever writer you are, whatever producer you are, you know, you, actors, we are different. We have to live that. Those yeah. characters you wrote, we have to breathe them, bring them to life, breathe fire into them, breathe sympathy into them, breathe naivete into them, um, breathe sorrow into them. 
And that's walking the walk. And that takes a toll. And mm-hmm. that takes a concentration and effort that is unfounded in any anything I can ever imagine because you're embodied physically, molecularly. Okay. And that's a different connection of spirit. Yeah. So it's being, it's being conscious of that for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much. One last question. And we asked this of everyone. What is one performance you think every actor should see and study and why? Oh, I would say all, right off the top, it, it would be the father. Uh, it's a, it, it, and oh, yeah. the whys of it with Anthony Hopkins are that it was, a, it's a play. And, um, and so you get a good sense of what a, a, the structure, the act structure of a play is. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's been made into a movie. And because of the nature of its storyline, you're able to experience that timely feeling of a play within the visuals of a film. Couple that with the performance of Anthony Hopkins, mm. which is he gets a chance through the scripted dialogue and attitude of its the father, the lead character, you get the chance to take a journey with him through many different emotions and um, from a young child to a, a younger man. He has all of these characters that, that take him over that are a part of him. And mm-hmm. it's a seamless, seamless piece. So it has strength in its visual quality, but it has a, a greater strength in the, uh, the theatrical nature of act structure couple that with visuals of film, but then it has a spirituality of something that's going to, that teaches you about the journey um, and the journey within, you know, Mm. through uh, dementia and other, other things that are addressed in the film. Um, So, you know, it's, it's a, it's a wonderful example of a great piece of entertainment and Anthony Hopkins is terrific. Beautiful. Yeah, that is absolutely, absolutely something that actors should study. Um, Thank you so much, Giancarlo. This has been so lovely. I I knew we would get an insight into your process, but not this deep of an insight. So thank you. Well, thank you so much. And it's been an absolute pleasure to share with you. In the Envelope is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City and Soundbox LA, Mark Grau Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Thanks as always to our producer extraordinaire, Jamie Muffet, and to the team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com, and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage by using the code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. That's right, 100% free. For more exclusive content, join us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope, and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Who would you like us to interview next? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another glimpse in the envelope.